I don't think I can make it on the outside, Andy. I've been in here most of my life. I'm an institutional man now. I guess it comes down to a simple choice, really. Get busy living. You get busy dying. Shawshank was definitely a slow build. Andy. It landed with a hollow thud at the box office. I mean, it was almost a disaster. It's a hard argument to make. You gotta go see this prison film. We got teased quite a bit in the press about it as being one of the, the worst titles for a film. How many people have come up to me on the street and said, I really like that Shink Shank thing. But hey, I saw the Scrimshaw re rejection and the Sham Shim Simba. That was really good, that Shaw Shilly movie, The Shoe Shaw, The Shoe Shine Redemption. Didn't do well at the box office. You know, it was the quietest seven Academy Award nominations I'd ever heard of in my life. And I don't think too many people saw it then, at that time. And then they did, and it kind of caught on. It was very telling to me that the following year, we were, we were the top rental of 1995 on video. And somehow it seeped into the culture, and somehow it, it, it seeped into people's hearts, and word of mouth has now brought it to a place of, of great esteem. I would venture to say that all the best movies were virtually ignored when they first came out. Um, Citizen Kane is one. Uh, um, it's a Wonderful Life is another. Both of those tanked at the box office. Here you have a movie where people are basically allowing for forgiveness to happen, allowing for redemption to happen. It really gives one hope about the uh, possibility for forgiveness and redemption on a whole in the society. Shawshank was, was just something that, that spoke to my heart. I know Frank from when he was doing student films. He, was a, he wanted to make a film out of uh, a story of mine called The Woman in the Room. And it was just a glorious film. And uh, he came to me later on and said he'd like to take a shot at adapting Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption as a film. Uh, a lot of people have said, gee, it would never have dawned on us to, to, to pick that story as a movie. It didn't seem very cinematic. To me, it seemed the most cinematic because it dealt really with, uh, with, with the human heart. And I said, sure, go ahead, Frank. And he did the screenplay pretty much on spec, and he sent it to me, and I read it, and I thought it was just just amazing, just a mind-blowing piece of work. But I thought, it'll never be made. I try to do what I always try to do when adapting an author whose work is, is, is great, which is to maintain the voice of the author. It was a great story, a real, as they say, page turner. You, what happens next, you know? I still think it's the best script that I've ever read. Uh, I, I think it's the most complete piece of work in script form that, that's out there. Stephen King and, and Frank, in his distillation of that story, had captured something, some deep longing, some, some deep reality that is universal. No, I read it when I was 12 years old. I think sometimes you wonder how things are going to evolve into uh, creative work. And when you have sort of a historical relationship with uh, a piece of literature, and then you have an emotional connection with the script, and you manage to get the role, I mean, that's perfect. That's a, that's a great point of departure. In order to keep King's voice intact as an author, I really needed Red to be telling us this story. Luckily, I had, uh, I had Morgan to be our guide through the story. Uh, when you have Morgan Freeman telling you the story, you get a great edge because uh, he's got this wonderful 
integrity. Goodness, this is the whole movie. <laughs> this guy sets everything. He's it. And they want me to do that? Right on. <laughs> yeah. The physical description of the character is written by Steve King. What? Pleasure. Listen, I'm, I, I gotta go now. Good night. Listen, if William Morris calls, right, I'm in uh, 59.